believe about the last days. Matthew chapter 24. For whatsoever, nope, if I get Matthew 24, that'll sound better. Matthew 24, 3. Um, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Then and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, just the privilege of being able to look into these things and consider what your word teaches about the last days. Help us to understand these things. Help us to be able to make them uh, just a part of our lives. And may we grow in grace as a result things we learn uh, today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Matthew 24 talks about, again, three different questions that are being asked. I assume, and again, this is just my assumption, so with this in, in the, like two bucks, you can go get a cup of coffee, but they're asking, I, I believe the disciples think they're asking one thing. They're asking one question, but they're actually asking three. Again, in verse 3, tell us, when shall these things be? Talking about when the temple will be destroyed. And that happened in 70 A.D. So tell us when these things should be. And what should be the sign of thy coming? Well, the Lord didn't come in 70 A.D. The Lord hasn't come yet. Uh, and so that's another thing. And of the end of the world. Well, that's another thing altogether. That's, that's not the same question by any stretch. But I assume that when they asked, they thought this was all the same thing. And uh, so they're asking this. And, and so the Lord does answer over uh, throughout the rest of this chapter and into the next chapter. He's answering these three questions, uh, not always necessarily in the order in which they're asked. And so you do have to, you have to understand that as you're reading through that. Otherwise, you, you come up with a confused idea of end times uh, prophecy and so on but we're talking about the last days and uh, we read this last week as Baptists we believe that we are living in the last days before Christ's return we believe that Christ will catch away or rapture all believers before the commencement of the tribulation we believe in the premillennial return of Christ to the earth in <coughs> order to set up his earthly kingdom and again that's two different things it's talking about the the uh, catching away of all believers and then the Lord's return to set up his kingdom. It's two different things. And uh, e even though they're all part of the return of Christ. So the characteristics of the last days we looked at last week and we saw that false Christianity is a sign of that or a character of the last days. National and international conflict. Uh, natural disasters. Religious persecution. Uh, abounding sin as well as extensive gospel preaching. Those are all characteristics of the last days and we look around and we we compare these characteristics to our world today and we say yep we're in the last days uh, yeah I mean you can't you can't come up with anything else we talked last week about the assurance of the Lord's return and we can be sure that the Lord is returning and that it is true that he is going to return because of all the prophecies that were literally and accurately fulfilled concerning Christ's first coming. So those were, those were fulfilled exactly as God gave it. So we know because of that, that the prophecies concerning his second coming, those are also going to be literally and accurately fulfilled. And we began last week to look at the nature of Christ's return. We saw it was a personal return, a bodily return, a visible return, and a sudden, unexpected uh, return. And then we're picking up here on page 2, letter E, all the way at the bottom of the page. And we see that 
The Lord's return is an imminent return. And what that means is it could happen at any moment. There is nothing that needs to happen. There's no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled before Christ comes to catch away all believers. Nothing. We're not waiting. We're not waiting on, on something to fall into place. There's nothing that needs to fall into place at all. And we see this here in uh, Matthew 24 and uh, verse 42, where Jesus said, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. You don't know. And we don't know. All those, uh, and, and there have been a lot of people down through the years who have said, Jesus is coming this time and Jesus is coming that time. And they've all been proven wrong. Every one of them. Uh, we even had one earlier this year. They said Jesus is coming, what, sometime in September. And then last year we had the four blood moons. So Jesus was coming then. And then I remember the big hoopla, and in, in some of you may remember this too, but in 2000, Y2K, oh, Jesus is coming, January 1st, 2000. And here we are in 2017. Not here yet. <laughs> I'm, being, I'm being sarcastic on purpose because that's, we don't know. The Lord said we don't know. And so who, who are we to think we can be so proud and so arrogant as to tell God, you said I don't know, but I figured it out. <laughs> That's stupid. It's just not how it works. Verse um, 43 here of Matthew 24, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Well, that's another thing, too. When they begin to prophesy and say, oh, yeah, the Lord's coming such and such a date. You know what? I know the Lord's not coming on that date because it says in such an hour that you think not. That's when he's coming. In Luke chapter 12, in verses 45 and 46, uh, Jesus says, But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and eat and drink and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in the day when he looketh not for him. And at that hour when he is not aware, will cut him in sunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. In Romans chapter 13 and verse number 11, <clears throat> excuse me, let us walk honestly as in the day. No, I'm sorry, verse 11. And then knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. What does that mean? The Lord's coming. He's coming soon. And it's near. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. Let, uh, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Well, that simply means he's real close. He's real close. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 37 says, uh, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. And will not tarry. It won't be long, and he'll be here. That's that's what that means. James chapter five and verse number eight. Uh, be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. <clears throat> and it's not in here, but in in uh, Revelation chapter twenty-two, Jesus almost the last words that Jesus speaks. In fact, I think it is the last words Jesus speaks uh, in the end of. The, the very last chapter of the very last book of the Bible, he said, surely I come quickly. And then John responded, even so come Lord Jesus. And so it's an imminent return. It could happen at any moment. Jesus could come right while we're in the middle of service. You know, I don't like disruptions to service, but I would be fine with that. I would be okay with the Lord coming. And uh, then I wouldn't have to finish, but we would know it all. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's some things that maybe we don't know like we ought to, but we'll know it all. Uh, just like he knows it uh, when he comes. We believe <clears throat> that, uh, talking about the nature of Christ's return, it is a pre-tribulational return. There are a good many people today who are confused. And it seems like there's more confusion today than what I remember in any other time in history where there are so many who believe in a mid-trib rapture. In other words, you go halfway through the tribulation period and then 
you get raptured out. But there are even some who believe in a post-trib rapture that you go all the way through the seven years of the tribulation and then you get raptured out. I am so glad that that's not the case. We believe in a pre-tribulational return. So the prophecy of the 70 weeks found in Daniel 9 teaches that there will be a period of approximately seven years between the rapture and the revelation. Remember, the rapture is when the Lord catches away all believers. The revelation is when the Lord comes back to the earth to establish his earthly kingdom. So there will be about seven years between. During Daniel's 70th week, the following events will occur. In on the earth will be the tribulation period. In heaven, the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. <clears throat> and there are two basic reasons we believe in a pre-tribulational return of Christ. First, the tribulation is specifically in the context of the nation of Israel. It is talked about in the Old Testament more than it's talked about in the New Testament. But it's talked about always in relation to Israel and not in relation to New Testament believers. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. Well, who, what was Daniel? He was a Jew. He was an Israelite. So it's the children of thy people. It's the Israelites he's talking about. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time... Thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. In Jeremiah chapter 30, and verse number 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So he's talking about that tribulation and calls it the time of Jacob's trouble, not the time of New Testament believers' trouble. So that's one reason why we believe in the pre-tribulation uh, rapture, but also... <clears throat> There's this other reason here, and that is that God promises to keep Christians from this terrible time on the earth. There's a bunch of scripture here. I'm going to try and read these very quickly because I have a long way to go and a short time to get there, sort of a thing. But uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, you're ready. You're ready for the Lord's coming. Uh, verse, um, verse 5. Hear uh, all the children of light and the children of the day. Hear not of the night nor of darkness. So again, he's talking about the Lord's coming and uh, taking us out before that time. And in verse 9, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. So he's coming to catch us away because he's not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, during the tribulation, that's a time when the wrath of God is poured out without mixture on um, this world that has not believed uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter 2 and verse 5, And spared not, talking about God, spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. What is he saying? He's saying before God sent judgment, he put Noah in a place where he wouldn't be touched. Before God sent judgment, he put Lot in a place where he wouldn't be touched. That is what he's saying. And so what he's saying is, the Lord knows how to deliver us who know Christ from the tribulation, the time of judgment that's coming on this world. Then in, in the, the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and verse 10, it says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So we believe that it is a pre-tribulation <coughs> return. But we also believe that it is a pre-millennial return. The Bible tells us of a coming age often referred to as the millennium. The millennial reign of Christ. It is the kingdom of Christ on earth. A 1,000 year era of peace and righteousness when Satan will be bound and the Lord Jesus Christ himself will be king. In uh, Revelation chapter 20, 
excuse me, verses 2 and 3. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. By the way, <clears throat> I just want you to understand, the devil's not cast into hell. That's not what it said. Read it again. It says he's cast into the bottomless pit. The two are not the same. He's not cast into hell. That's, that's something else altogether. And that's another lesson for another time. But I just wanted to throw that out there. Verse 6 <clears throat> says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no part. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. It doesn't say out of hell. Out of his prison. And it already said that's the bottomless pit. And another thing about that, the idea that because Satan is let out of the bottomless pit, he's let out of this prison so there's no more hell, that doesn't work. Because just a few verses later, when you go down to verse 14, it says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Hell still in existence after Satan's already been loosed from the bottomless pit. Hell is still in existence throughout all eternity because it is incorporated into the lake of fire. That's what it says. So hell doesn't all of a sudden stop. It's incorporated into the lake of fire and continues again for all eternity. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's not really part of the lesson. That's just a little freebie there. So we believe in a premillennial return uh, when, when the Lord will come. And it's a two-stage return. And we've already mentioned this, <clears throat> but uh, we'll go through this anyway. So from a prophetic standpoint, the first coming of Christ involved two distinct stages, his birth and his death. Those are two distinct stages. So the cradle and the cross, they say, because uh, they're trying to alliterate. But in like fashion, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will occur in two phases. Two phases, so you have the rapture. The word rapture is not found in the Bible. And there are a lot of people who say, oh, you people who believe in the rapture, you know, that's not even found in the Bible. You're not even believing anything that, that's right. Well, we also believe in the Trinity. But the word Trinity is not found in the Bible either. You know, there's a lot of things we talk about. You know, I, I believe in an automobile. An automobile is not found in the Bible either. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you can be really silly about that. You know, the, the word rapture is not found there, but certainly the truth of the rapture is. Uh, the word rapture means caught up, which is exactly how, how uh, God describes uh, the Lord's coming for all believers. <clears throat> and then the term rapture, uh, I, I, well, anyway, let, let's look at this in um, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Then over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Excuse me. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. See, there's that word caught up. We'll be raptured. We'll be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The revelation, on the other hand, means to reveal and it refers prophetically to the visible return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. See, the rapture, the Lord never actually comes to the earth. And that's what it says. We'll meet the Lord in the air. But here in the revelation, this, now he's coming to the earth. And uh, he returns in power <coughs> and glory. Back over in Luke chapter 21, in verse 25. It says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking for those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. 
And this is talking about the tribulation. It's not talking about now. It's talking about during the tribulation period. You read through the book of Revelation, there's a direct correlation here. And, and you see that where the sun's darkened, the moon doesn't give forth its light, and so on. Uh, verse 27, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. So he's coming uh, back to the earth. In, uh, back in Revelation chapter 19, you, you find this, <clears throat> the same thing being described in uh, verse 11, Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and righteousness, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That makes it pretty clear who it's talking about, uh, because uh, Jesus is called the Word. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. So and then in verse 14 of John 1, it, it continues and says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, but anyway, so let's go on verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. That would be the believers who have already been caught away. They're in heaven with the Lord. That kind of ties in with what we were talking about in the earlier service. So they're in heaven with the Lord. And they follow him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And so we'll, we'll stop there. But so here's the differences between the rapture and the revelation. Because a lot of people, they try and mix them, try and make, uh, tell us it's all the same, and uh, you know, you're wrong. But the, the, the scripture makes it clear. And uh, I, I'm not going to, well, no, we can. In, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. So let's go back over there. And, and we're going to see these differences. So five different things that are different between the rapture and the revelation. The first thing is Christ in the clouds. I already mentioned Christ will be coming in the air. First, first Thessalonians 4, verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So he's not coming back to the <coughs> earth. We'll meet him, uh, in, <coughs> the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, in contrast to that, Back over in the book of Zechariah, which is in the Old Testament, and it's like Matthew, and you turn to the left, and you go back Malachi, and then Zechariah. So it's two back from the New Testament. Zechariah chapter 14, verse number 4, and it's talking about the revelation when the Lord returns to set up his kingdom. And it says this, and his, talking about the Lord, his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. That's not in the air. That's not in the clouds. That's different. He's coming back, and he's going to set his feet on the earth once again. Then back over in 1 Thessalonians 4. So you need to kind of keep a finger over here, I guess. Uh, but we see that the rapture is a time of joy. The hardest time that we will ever have as believers is right now. This is it. And I know sometimes it is hard. Sometimes there are difficulties. And sometimes things are very difficult. But this is as bad as it's ever going to be. Because once the Lord comes, we already talked about the things that are going to be missing in heaven as far as we're concerned. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more death, no more pain. And, and so this is as bad as it's going to get. And that's a wonderful thing. So the rapture for us is a time of great joy because it, it, it's the end of all these problems, of all these trials that we've uh, suffered uh, through the years. So, in, in the, here in First Thessalonians four eighteen, wherefore comfort one another with these words. So, uh, looking toward the rapture, it is comforting. It is joyous to look forward to that. But on the other hand, talking about the revelation, you see that 
the Lord's coming back to the earth, that's a time of gloom. We're talking about for those who are on the earth. It's a time of gloom. It's not a, a, an exciting time, not a joyous time. In, uh, in Joel chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as uh, the morning spread upon the mountains, a, a great people and the strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. It's not a good time. It's not an exciting time. So that's different. So it can't be the same thing because they're different. Then, again, back in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17, it is a time of union with Christ. We've been, I mean, obviously, Christ dwells within us in the person of the Holy Spirit. But we have been physically separated from Christ since we were saved. I mean, all our lives. You know, we're not like the apostles. We, we didn't get the, the opportunity three and a half years to walk with him and to hear him ourselves. We've never seen him. But that's one of the joys of the rapture is that we will then be united with our Savior. We will see him as he is, John tells us. Here in verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So what does that tell us? From this point on, there will be no separation. No more separation from the Lord. It'll be union with Christ. But back over in the book of Joel chapter 3, talking about the revelation, it tells us that his coming will be a time of judgment. Israel's going to be judged. I mean, they've gone through judgment in the tribulation, but Israel's going to be judged. There will be the judgment of the nations that uh, Jesus told us about when he comes back uh, in, in judgment in, uh, on all those nations that have come against Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. All of that, it's a time of judgment, not a time of union with Christ. Boy, isn't this wonderful? That's not the way the world's going to look at it. Uh, Joel chapter 3 and verse 12 says this, Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. That doesn't sound like a good time, so shall they ever be with the Lord. It's more like a, you know, crying to the mountains, fall on us. Uh, like, like they'll do during the tribulation. Then uh, back in Matthew chapter 25, and uh, verse number 13. <clears throat> The rapture is always imminent, and we, we already talked about this, but we see again here in Matthew 25, 13, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. It's imminent. It could be any time that Jesus comes. Uh, and, and on the other hand, back in chapter 24, uh, we see that at the revelation when the Lord comes back to set up the earthly kingdom, that's going to be preceded by signs. And we already mentioned some of those. Uh, here in verse 29, Matthew 24, 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in the heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So again, you see, it's not a time of joy. Not a time of joy at all, but it's preceded by signs. There are going to be things going on to let them know, hey, we're in the tribulation. Jesus is coming very soon to set up his earthly kingdom. And uh, not, not a good time. Then, again, back in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 14, the rapture is in reference to the saints. Does that mean really, really good people? Is that what saints means? I love this. You know, uh, the book of Psalms, and I, I can't remember the exact reference off the top of my head. But I've mentioned before that the Bible is the best Bible dictionary there is because it explains itself if we will take the time to study and to be patient. And so uh, I, I know time and time again people have told my dad, oh, I pray to the saints. you know, And, and I remember him always going to that verse in the Psalms. 
where it defines what a saint is. Someone who's made a covenant with God by means of a sacrifice. Hmm. I wonder if that might be those of us who trusted in Christ as our only sacrifice for sin. Well, of course, that's what that's talking about. That, that's exactly what that's talking about. So when, when the Bible talks about saints, it's talking about those of us who are saved. It's not talking about a select group of really, really good people. You say, well, I'm not really good. No, you're not. And, you know, there's not that many of us for me to be saying that, is there? <laughs> but it's still true. I mean, I mean, none of us. There's none good. No, not one. That includes me. That includes all of us. The only thing good about us is Christ. That's it. And that's what makes us a saint. Not because we're really, really good people, but because of Christ. Because we've made a covenant with him through his sacrifice for us. So when we're talking about the rapture being in reference to the saints, we're simply saying those who've trusted Christ. Those who have been born again. Those who've been saved. First Thessalonians 4.14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, what's that? That's a believer. That's a saint. Uh, Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So this, the rapture, is in reference to the saints. Meanwhile, back in the book of Zechariah chapter 14, uh, Zechariah chapter 14, we see that the revelation is in reference to Israel because the kingdom has always been a part of God's promise to Israel. Not necessarily part of the promise to us. We get to have part in it because he's made us kings and priests, uh, the Bible tells us. But in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 9, the Bible says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. And it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place. From Benjamin's <coughs> gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's winepress. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. So the the revelation when Christ comes to set up his kingdom, that's in reference to Israel. We Again, we get to come with him and we get to participate, but it really is more to do with them. So, but there are some similarities, and let's look at this. Similarities between the rapture and revelation. Uh, both are sudden and generally unexpected events. Now, um, we're raptured, we're in heaven, we're coming back to the earth with Christ at the revelation. We know when that's going to happen because we'll be with him. So we'll know when, when Jesus you know, says it's time to go, then we know it's time to go. But those on the earth won't, even though, I mean, they could count if they would look and believe the Bible. They could count and they could figure out, okay, there's all these things going on, just like the Bible said. So at this time, Jesus should be coming. They're still not going to figure it out. Uh, and, and so it's going to be, as far as those still on the earth, it'll be unexpected. Both involve the personal bodily return of Christ. He will bodily come in the clouds uh, to call away all believers, and then he'll bodily return to the earth. To set up his kingdom. And then the rapture is Christ coming for his saints. Meanwhile, the revelation is Christ coming with his saints. Again, in Matthew 24, 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. So that's the Lord coming for his saints. And then in Revelation 19, 14, is the Lord coming with his saints and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, considering the characteristics of the last days, it's pretty clear we're living in those last days. And knowing that we're living in the last days, knowing that Christ could return at any moment to catch away all believers, God's people ought to rejoice. Again, like I said earlier, it's not that we ought to run around and, and act crazy. But I'm saying there ought to be a peace in our heart. This world's a mess, but we know the Lord's coming. And we know not as he not only is he coming, but he's coming for me. And I don't have to worry about this mess anymore. And so it ought to cause us to rejoice. It's something we can look forward to, uh, even in spite of all the things we see going on around us. Well, let's Let's uh, stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and, and just think about what God's told us. About.
about these last days.